Hello, Andre. How are you? Hi, doing Harry. Today? Doing good. good. Thank you. Good. Great. Andre, as you know, is the CEO and founder of Miro, the online collaboration platform. Um, especially during COVID, the company went through an enormous growth spurt and is now serving 45 million users a month. Uh, Andre, Miro clearly has been a product-led growth success story for the people in the room. W what are the secrets to building a product-led growth company? Yeah, my pleasure to share those insights with you folks here. So we started in 2011 and we shipped our first product in 2012. And since then, it was a lot of iteration toward kind of today's success of the business and of the product. And from day one, we were focused on our users. And this is the key for me in terms of product-led growth. When you understand your user, when you understand your user behavior in the product, when you understand the problem your user is trying to solve with your product, you can iterate toward better, better solution for them, better fit for them. So we uh, took our initial cohorts of users back in the day, and we had all different users from education, from product, from engineering, from, from marketing, from different departments. And even some users were uh, using the product for their personal, personal goals. So we took all of them and we start iterate toward like what resonates with the key cohorts and where we see the best retention. And once we found uh, those users and once we found uh, where retention is flattening over time, we start to build around that and we start to iterate the onboarding, we start to iterate uh, product value around that and start to iterate how we can uh, drive the, the virality. So that's what took several years to actually figure out and, and, and build. And uh, once we optimized all these user journeys and build kind of best leak UX for them, it started to grow organically really fast. And as some people say, like when you hit product market fit, you feel it. Uh, and you, we, we actually remember this uh, time when we uh, send service to our users and ask, like, hey, how would you feel about uh, Mira would not be there anymore? At that time, it was real-time board, actually. We ask, like, how would you feel if real-time board is not available anymore? And people were strongly disappointed about that. So as well, we saw, like, pretty, pretty strong organic uh, uh, word of mouth around the product. So at that time, we clearly understood that this is happening now, the product market is happening, and we start to layer marketing and sales, which was also layered in a product-led growth way, where marketing and sales were connected with the product signals, with the usage, and try to extend the journey and like, bring bigger customers uh, on a journey where they need help and support. So that's, uh, that's what we did, and um, to summarize, I think that key uh, for product-led growth is understanding your user, their behavior, building best-in-class user experience, and um, yeah, advancing that through marketing and sales, which is working as the same engine. Were there particular features in the product or aspects to the product that made the product-led growth model particularly viable? Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of functions, we had um, a bunch of... Um, a bunch of things that we focused on. For example, we organized our product uh, in a way where we create value and distribute value. And um, a lot of teams, like product teams, they just do both. And we separated that. Like one team was focused on creating value and the second team was focused on how they optimize the journey, how they optimize the conversion rates on the journey. And that was one of the decisions that we made early in the day, which uh, was pretty successful for us. Uh, and uh, there are a bunch of other things that we did, like, for example, our gross um, organization consists of gross marketing and gross product, and they work together. It's a tribe. Uh, while product reports to product organization, gross marketing reports to marketing organization, they work together. They have shared goals. They have shared uh, KPIs, and they work toward those goals together. So this is another organizational decision, organizational architecture that we did to, to support these dynamics um, and to build truly product-led growth. We, we 
CL organization, uh, uh, not like in silos where like product is working separately, success separately, marketing separately, uh, or, or other functions. We see it as a consistent journey, and the organization is built around the journey of the user and the customer. There are a lot of things to improve as an every organization, but that's the foundational kind of philosophy around how we organize it. Got it. Um, COVID hit. Suddenly, organizations needed a tool like Miro to run their business. There was no way around it. They needed something like this. And you were in the market at, at the right time and at, and at the right place. Your organization grew dramatically. Um, how did you manage that? And how did you manage to have what is still a very consistent culture across all the offices and across all the employees that you have? It was hard. Um, last couple of years were really difficult for us. Uh, when the COVID started, we were around 240 people organization. And today we are almost 1,800 people organization. Uh, we were around 3, 4 million users on our platform. And today we are around 50 million users on our platform. So we had a tremendous growth in the last uh, several years. And uh, the biggest kind of challenge was uh, to what you say is to find the right people for the organization, onboard them properly and make them successful with the business. So what we did is we, it was before COVID, but we codified our values. We did it in 2017 when we as a leadership team uh, came up together and tried to realize what is kind of shared values uh, we have here and what makes us um, to the point where we are in the journey. So we codified all those values. And then, especially when we started to hyperscale the organization, we integrated those values in every touch point uh, of a uh, new employee's journey. From um, like surfacing them on the website and attracting people who share those values to have value-based interviews during every interview with every new employee. Um, employee to having a two weeks culture onboarding and to having performance management focused not just on what people deliver but also on how they did it and how was um, also and is also reflecting the values that people uh, live or not. Uh, um, so all of those touch points were uh, built in and they helped us to scale the organization where we still feel like at this size of the organization with one company. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a lot of things to do. One of our key values is iteration. I don't believe there is um, something that is like at the top of the performance. I think there are a lot of things that we can do better as an organization. But I think we have very strong foundations to iterate on top. In a way, to grow from 3.5 million users to 50 million users today, in just a matter of two or three years, is the definition of hyperscaling. What are, what are the secrets to hyperscaling, and, and what are the three things that really made a difference? Yeah, uh, like different companies have different uh, situations where they kind of accelerated. Uh, we were growing pretty fast before pandemic, so we were doing like almost 3x year over year. Uh, in terms of the business. So pandemic boosted us even more. And one of the things that I personally learned uh, through all this hyperscale journey is how we can make decisions uh, fast. So because you have to hire 50 uh, heads and leaders in your organization. You have to uh, change your organization like multiple times every month. You work as a CEO uh, in different organizations every quarter because your job also changes. Like It's the same name, but it's a very different job. Um, and all of those things uh, kind of impact uh, my performance. But if it's my performance, it's the organization performance. And what I understood is like I need to make fast and high quality decisions. And that's what you have to learn, that's what you have to develop. I do it in a way where I have a bunch of advisors where I can go and validate my, my assumptions, my insights. Uh, I also try to triangulate anything I want to kind of decide on. Like I'm trying to bring different perspectives 
on every decision. And I'm trying to do it fast. You need to build a network that helps you to, to make those uh, things fast. Because if you, once you need to decide on something, and once you only start to build a network around that decision, it, it can go a long way. So, so what, what I learned is like fast decision making, high quality decision making, and bringing people who share the value, who, uh, uh, values of the company, who share the mission of the company. And we, we live our mission. I personally um, wake up every day, and I think that my biggest motivation to continue run and develop the company is the excitement around the mission. Uh, Miro's mission is empower teams to create the next big thing. And when I think about Miro being behind all positive changes in the world, I'm really motivated. I'm fulfilled by that mission. And that also helped us to survive and grow through the pandemic mm. because uh, this is the story you tell to your team, to your customers, to your users. And this is the story that you find people who it will resonate with. Um, and if you have a lot of people with who it resonates, they will be engaged. And if they will be engaged, you move the business and the, and the problem that you are trying to solve forward. So these are a bunch of lessons I learned through the pandemic. So strong values, mission-driven organization, fast decision-making, high-quality decisions, having a strong network, triangulate insights, and yeah, act fast upon them. What ended up being easier than you thought it would be? And what ended up being harder in this journey? I think the hardest part of uh, our business is people. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the most um, kind of uh, fulfilling part uh, because we all come together to co-create. Uh, we all are kind of you know, creative creatures so who are um, trying to change status quo, who are, coming to, who are trying to come up with something new. But at the same time, we are all humans. We have our emotions, we have reactions, we have our disappointments, excitements, and challenging times. And the hardest thing is like to uh, keep motivation going. It all starts with us as a leaders, but it's also uh, necessary to make sure that the team feels uh, that they are in the right place, that they are heard, that they are included. Because if we don't walk the walk inside the business, uh, our customers would not kind of feel that. And we as a company, we as a product, we provide this platform for empowering teams to create the next big thing. And our customer is a team, is a group of people who come together to create something. And we need to charge them with an energy, not just to ship uh, software to them. So that's, that's what I think is the hardest thing in terms of um, kind of hyper growth and leading the company. But also on the, on the easier side, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, the easiest side is uh, to make, um, you know, to, the easiest side is to let things go like and uh, be in a bit of a passenger seat. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm speaking about that because I've been in a lot of situations where I let myself to be in a passenger seat in some decisions, and I regret that in a bunch of them. I would kind of be more in a driver's seat where I had this initial gut feel, I need to be in a driver's seat. So that's the easiest, like to be in a passenger seat and see how it goes. Right. So. For many software companies, to be number one in the world, you've got to be number one in the US. And actually, the hardest bit for a software company is to land in the US, not only with customers, but also with, with employees. How did that work at Miro? Yeah, um, definitely. Like We started a company in Europe, and we have our product engineering in Europe, while our users and customers were across the world. We are um, spread pretty evenly between Europe and the and the US in terms of revenue and usage. And I was intentional um, when I was thinking of hiring go-to-market that it should be in the US. And if we look today at the organization, the majority of the leadership of the business is in the US, and especially go-to-market leadership. And that helped us to balance our um, kind of leadership 
focus across all regions. So our chief revenue officer is in the U.S., chief customer officer in the U.S., chief marketing officer in the U.S., chief sales officer in the U.S., and a bunch of other leaders are in the U.S. While um, in Europe we have a chief product officer, chief technology officer, myself, and a head of self serve business and growth. So we balance this team between two continents to make sure that we are growing uh, fast in both regions and that we are making global decisions that serves all regions at the same time. We added Japan, we added Australia, we strengthened our European presence uh, in the last couple of years. And the idea was to make sure that the leadership is evenly spread to make all markets a success. <laughs> so you have enough people to make it a success, but you also have enough balance for those people in other regions not to gravitate toward one market. Yeah. So that's what we did and worked pretty well for us so far. We're happy with the distribution of our customers and users across regions. And yeah, if you are kind of organically started in, in Europe, uh, and your product engineer is here, maybe your hires should be there to, 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 to go after that market. Even if you do it in Europe, I would definitely go with the talent that saw how to grow the business in the US. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very different, um, in a way, operational cadence that I notice in the US. And in some positions in Europe, we bring people from the US to fill those positions because they know how to hyperscale and how to, to, to support the business through this uh, growth stage. So yeah, that's, that's what I would think of. Was it hard to attract great people in the US early on? Because typically it's people don't know the product, people don't know the company, they're reluctant to join something that they haven't really heard about. Um, was it hard in the beginning and did it, became easier, did it become easier later on? I think it's every time hard. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a thing that you should appreciate. It's a hard thing to hire best-in-class people. And what I do, I try to understand, I try to benchmark what awesome looks like in every role, in every job. Before I go into hiring, I actually start to dig into my network and ask people who are best-in-class operators in this or that role what they accomplished. Um, do they know how to do zero to one, or they are more um, kind of operators at a scale when they can scale things? So that's what I start with. I, I start with understanding who are best in class people out there. I learn from them. I calibrate against them, and then I start search. And I don't give up until I find the best in class person for the business. And yeah, we have some searches going for almost two years. But it's worth it because um, the time you onboard the person into the business, the time you kind of uh, you give the person to build their organizations, to develop a culture, it's huge. Like, and if you do something wrong, um, it will cost you way more than the cost of delayed hire. And um, of course, like hiring is one of my key priorities as a CEO, like I run all the leadership searches myself, um, the people who report to me, like uh, I'm trying to be on top of those things. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of work to make it right. But that's definitely not the work you will fully delegate someone. You definitely can have people who help you in this. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, pretty lucky to have those people on my team who helped me with this, but it's, it's my job to hire right leaders for the company. You sometimes talk about managers who can do zero to one and other managers who can do one to infinity. Can you explain what you mean by that and how it's as relevant to you today? Sure, yeah. Um, so for those who are in a product world, you know that like iteration from zero to one before you got into product market fit is very different from when you scale things uh, when they kind of hit, hit, hit the customer, hit the uh, relevant usage. Same as with the rest of the business, you have a bunch of things that you have to build in the business. 
you have to build policies, and you don't want these policies to be just formal operational kind of uh, papers. You want these things to enable people to make uh, faster decisions, to have more autonomy, to be empowered. You need to build a culture, and it also requires uh, leadership skills. You need to build your go-to-market machine, and you have to iterate through your I don't know, inbound engine, or you have to iterate through your sales pitch uh, at scale, especially when you move from one persona to another at scale. You have to iterate on, um, I don't know, like even financial reporting. I was um, really surprised um, to see financial reporting from one of the uh, companies that I'm following how smart they are in uh, their financial reporting and like what metrics they actually look and it's like maybe we need to adjust like 20 percent our financial reporting to look at the right numbers and then as a result to incentivize the organization around those numbers so all those things required builder skills and what i mean under builder skills you have to identify opportunities you have to validate a bunch of hypotheses you actually have to grab a bunch of hypotheses from your network uh, of people who report to you or uh, who are peers in similar companies. You have to validate those hypotheses against each other. You have to test them uh, with your potential users. And then if something works, scale. If something doesn't work, scale, scale back and iterate further. So it all requires like this zero to one mindset and iterative mindset. And a lot of great operators they never did it because they didn't build companies from scratch. So what I look at when I interview people is, do they actually zoom in into details? Do they actually come up uh, from first principles while they have iterative approach to things that they do? And it's hard. It's hard to find those people uh, out there. But at least you have to find people who can be coachable and who can iterate with you together on those things. So that's, that's what I mean when I say zero to one. You're now the CEO of a business with 1,800 employees. W what are the things that you like doing and how do you make sure that you can still do some of those things? Yeah, I love doing products. I love doing kind of, I love being engaged with the product design. And my, my biggest passion is when I see we deliver the value and that value being consumed. That's my biggest question, passion. So my favorite channel in Slack is product news. Mm. So this is the channel that I read uh, first every morning. I read it like every evening first when I go into Slack um, because that that's tells me about what's our velocity as a business in terms of delivering value, how we package that value, what are the learnings? What are the insights we're getting? And then checking if this value resonates with our audience or not. That's kind of what I love to, um, learning and, and be involved with. Um, I try to be involved in several strategic uh, product explorations, product design explorations, and contribute um, to, to, to the team. Uh, I'm definitely not the driver for those, but I'm a, I, I consider myself as a part of the team. And uh, people might be surprised, hey, what CEO is doing here? Like, we're discussing this, uh, this small thing, but I'm, I'm kind of positioned myself as one of the people on the team. And like, you can, you can pick up my brain, you can pick up my insight, you can skip it, it's, it's up to you. But I'm here to, to contribute and, um, and uh, bring kind of my 10 years insights being in this space. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other things that you have to do as a CEO. And um, I'm trying to uh, spread my time, not equally, but kind of in a way where I'm on top of things in all other parts of the organization. It's definitely hard, and I don't know way more than I know these days. Uh, but um, as a CEO, I think it's a responsibility to make sure you are staying on top of things uh, in a business and helping the business uh, move forward in any way possible. So, What are the things that stress you? And, and how do you deal with it? Yeah. Um, things that are stressful. And, you know, um, I, I had this uh, moment recently, a couple months ago, when um, we all came together after a pandemic 
and there were like 1,600 people in front of me, and I had to deliver the next uh, next organizational um, organizational evolution kind of where we go and how we go as a, as a company, as a, as, a, as, a, as a culture. And it was pretty stressful to be back in front of uh, the room of people uh, with a lot of them I never met before. And I did it, and then I was pretty relieved after that. But in terms of work, I'm not stressed much. So I think as long as you understand the problem, as long as you pick it up and act quickly, um, and see things are moving forward as a business. I was like, it's it's a part of the job, so it doesn't stress me out. Cool. On that note, Andre, it was a true pleasure to uh, to chat, and um, onwards we go. Thank you, Harry. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs>